Okay, let's open with a word of prayer and then we'll get back into Genesis chapter 10. Okay, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who has given us your word, uh, your word in writing and your word in Jesus. We thank and praise you for that. And today as we come to your word, just open our hearts and minds that we truly might make it effective for our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, we're looking at Genesis 10. And I told you I'm going to skip this because of all the names. Uh, no, I'm not quite going to skip it, okay? Um, what I handed out, and I have more people here than what I an anticipated today. So if we could share, um, there is this chart of the descendants of Shem, Ham, and Jepheth. And you can, what this is, is chapter 10 on a map. Okay? So it kind of it kind of shows you how after the Tower of Babel they went out and settled all the different areas. Now, as you're reading this, please remember you got to think eastern, not western, and it looks like, you know, as Americans we would like chapter 10 to come before chapter 11. It doesn't, okay? Because there's generations they're talking about here. Okay, so they tell you the generations and then they tell you in chapter 11 when we get to the Tower of Babel how they're dispersed out. Okay, a couple of things, um, I'm not going to read through all of this, but just um, a couple of things for, uh, for your information. Um, these are called, sometimes called the Table of the Nations. And there's actually seven nations mentioned in chapter 10. And the way they get the seven nations is Japheth, who is listed first. He's probably the oldest of the three sons who went into the ark. He has, from his children, 14 nations. Ham has 30 nations. And Shem has 26 nations to make 70, 70 nations. Later on, this will be played out when Jacob's family goes down to Egypt, how many family members are with him when they go down there? Seventy. There's seventy. Okay? So, seventy for the, the Jewish people, remember seven was a number of completion. You multiply it by, by ten, it's really complete. Okay? That's the way they would look at it. The, the Japhites are really around the Black Sea. You'll see that. The Hemites are around Southeast Asia and Upper Africa, Egypt. They talk about uh, Lower and Upper Egypt. In those days, it was um, kind of divided. Uh, the sons of Cush are Arabia. The Jebusites are around Jerusalem. The Shemites are east of Mesopotamia. But that chart really gives it all to you. So is there any questions about that? Yeah. Could you repeat the number of nations? Yeah. Seven, seven, seventy nations. Yeah. Seven. yeah. Uh, Jepheth, 14. Ham, 30. This, this is his, their descendants. Okay. So Jepheth's descendants make 14 different nations. Ham's descendants make 30 nations, and Shem's descendants make 26 nations. Each son is a nation. Is that right? Well, the, um, the, the, the sons of the sons of the sons. Sometimes it's grandchildren of Noah's children. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Does that, okay, so any other questions on chapter 10? Um, descendants of Goma, Gomer, Gomer, and Javan. And if you look through, um, I believe, uh, look, look at chapter, uh, verse 3, the sons of Gomer, and then the sons of Javan. So uh, uh, verse 3 and 4, those are the ones that come over here. Okay? 
that answer your question? Yeah. Well, I, I'm not going to go through all of these. It doesn't mean very much to us. Yeah. It's possible. Yeah. Probably. Not not possible, probably. Yeah. But you notice there's a lack of any of the female names. Because it always went by the male line. And that's when you come into the New Testament, when they list the, the line of Jesus, they list it from Joseph in one of the Gospels and Mary from the other one because Joseph wasn't a blood relative of Jesus. And so already they're, they're realizing the Immaculate Conception. I, I hear people say to me, well, th that whole thing about Mary and Immaculately Conceived, that was later on in the church. No, I mean, they were, they were thinking that way from the earliest times. Yeah. Nowadays, believe it or not, this is what I'm told, is that, you know, Jewish people really want to follow the descendants, and they, they do a lot of that. Nowadays, they follow by the mother's line. And uh, they, <laughs> I, I've been told this. I don't know if this is an over-exaggeration, but they say, nowadays, you don't know who the father is, but you know who the mother is. So. Descendants are more than one generation, sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's, it's multiple generations, multiple. That's what I said. It's children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren are going to make up these nations. And the, descendants of those. and the descendants of those, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's chapter 10. <gasps> Five minutes. I did a whole chapter. Now we'll get to 11. <laughs> okay. The Tower of Babel. What do you know about the Tower of Babel? That's where they confuse the languages. Yes, where God confused the languages. Yes. This was not uncommon even after the Tower of Babel. A lot of people's groups tried to build higher to get to heaven. Uh, think uh, the only one that I can think of that I personally been to is um, is the Az Aztec one down in um, what <laughs> Mexico? Yeah, the Mayan, the Mayans. Yeah, and you used to be able to. Cl I I actually climbed up to the top of that, but you're not allowed to anymore. What What is the name of the ruins there? <laughs> That's it. Were you just there? And you couldn't go up to the top. Now, nowadays, then, uh, um, this was 10, 15 years ago, you could, you could walk those steps, and I did. Yeah, I walked all the way up. Yeah. But this, you know, they built, and then usually what, uh, for, for a lot of the people around Israel, they would, they would build this tower up as high as they could, and then they would build some sort of shrine up at the top. I think they were called, um, I want to say minarets, but I know they talk about minarets today. I don't know if that's the word they called them. Yeah. Is that? Yeah, I know that's the towers in Islam. I, there is a name for them in, in some of the ancient ruins that are the towers. I thought it was minarets, but I could be wrong. Okay. Anyway, uh, Verse 1, now the whole world had one language and a common speech because they all were related because of the Noah and the ark. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. This is probably the area that we would call Mesopotamia today. They said to each other, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone. Uh, I'm told the reason that was is because that area that, that they think it was in didn't have a lot of stone in it. So they, they said, okay, let's instead of using stone, we're going to use these bricks. 
and they had learned how to bake them, okay, and tar for mortar. So they, used, they knew about tar, and they would, um, would put these together. It would also last. I mean, you put tar over a baked brick, and it would last for a long period of time. Now, this is, this is the problem. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heaven so that we might make a name for ourselves. So, you know, they're very egotistical. It's all about power, our pride, uh, yeah, John? Did you ever think about the brain power of somebody that's down the ground and I'm going to power to heaven by hand? Yeah. I mean, you know, doesn't sound like they're too bright. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, think, I think they had more knowledge of building than what we give them credit for sometimes. Because there's some things even today in the ancient world that we can't explain. You know, uh, some of the some of the, the blocks they moved and the building of the pyramids and, you know, um, there, there's, um, and, and I'm sure Terry could tell you about this, there's a, a tunnel in, in Jerusalem. It's called Hezekiah's Tunnel, okay? Hezekiah was a king and he, he had a well outside of the city limits of Jerusalem and they were worried if someone attacked and got a hold of the well and poisoned the well, they'd have no water in the city of Jerusalem. So they, they closed it up and built from there into the city a, a, a tunnel, Hezekiah's tunnel. And they started from both ends, and they met in the middle, almost. Okay? We don't know how, how they did it. We still... The, you know, there's debates over that, how they, they made it. They, what happened was they came really close together. I, I, I want to say, was it a meter? I, I want to say it was like... A, a, a real severe terminal. Yeah, there's a real... Yeah, as you, you can walk through it these days. And, and there was a real severe turn. And one of the workers coming one way heard something, and they were silent, and they tapped... And they said, oh, they're over there, and then went over. So they m missed going, and how they did it, we don't know. And it's, it's a slope all the way down. They have a gradual slope, so the water would go down into the well in Jerusalem. Engineering, we don't know how they did it. So it, we, there's debates over it. I shouldn't say that, I you know. Understand. I don't understand how they did that either. But yeah. Just thinking I can build a car, heaven on my armor track. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know, I know. How high do we got to go to get to heaven? Yeah. We're going to go as high as we can. That's, that's the feeling, you know. Um, you know, when you said that, John, maybe, maybe I'll, I, I, I always say that and I say it anyway. I, I heard this week, it was the, was it the 20th anniversary of the, um, the, uh, they used to build, what'd they call that? A&M, the bonfire. The bonfire, you know? And, and supposedly they had that engineered. And I heard some accounts this week where someone said, we, we, didn't, we didn't think that that would ever happen, and it just collapsed all of a sudden, you know? So I, I, guess, there, <laughs> I guess it could easily happen, Okay. But the point of this is they were not trying to follow God. They were trying to get to God. Okay? And it's a very prideful thing. Okay? Egotistical. We can reach God rather than God is reaching out to us. And that's been a problem throughout the history of the church. Okay? But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the, the people were building. The Lord said... If as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. So at this time of history, he's saying, we've got to stop this. And then look at verse 7. Come, let us go down. Who is the us? The Trinity. Yes, we believe that's the Trinity. Okay? Um, and we see that at the beginning of Genesis, and we're going to see that throughout Genesis. It's always plural. 
and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. So this prideful, egotistical thing to try to get to God fails because God in intervenes. Now that's going to be changed again. When is that going to change? When is God going to change that? Well, I was thinking Pentecost. When now they could speak the languages and they're coming back together again. So now we have a, a responsibility to be able to get that good news out in every language. So God, God's Spirit is guiding that new coming together. Okay? All right. So, um, what verse? Okay, uh, verse 9, right? That is why it is called Babel. Anybody know what Babel means? Yes. It, no, it means the gate to God. The gate to God. They thought this was our gate to getting up to God. Yeah, it's all part of the story. Okay. Because there the Lord confused. Anybody? Oh, and I know this is a rhetorical question. I, I won't even ask. I was going to say, anyone know what the Hebrew word is for confused? Yes, it's Babel. Confused. It's, it's, uh, it, there's one letter difference between the Tower of Babel and Babel. Okay? But they're using that word play. Okay? That gate to God that they thought was going to be so great was where they got confused. God confused the language of the whole world. For there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. I, I often wonder how that happened. Can you imagine not being, all of a sudden not being able to talk with somebody? You know, you have a brother who you... Yeah. Yeah. Among the families, yeah. Yeah, I, I imagine there, there, there had to be common, but there, there was differences. Probably, it doesn't say this. I'm, I'm going to say there were 70 different languages. Because then they separated into the 70 nations. It's possible. Who knows? You know? So, some languages you can kind of, you know, you can kind of get through a little bit. But a lot of languages are so different, you just can't get through it. I, I'm, I'm trying to think of how many known languages there are in the world. Anybody know that? Can someone Google that for me? <laughs> known spoken languages. Not written languages, because there's a lot of languages today that are not written but are spoken. So there, for translators, like Lutheran Bible translators, the first thing you got to do is get a written language down and teach the people their language before you can translate the scriptures into their language. 6,500. 6,500 spoken languages. Now Google this for me. How many, how many languages has the New Testament been translated into? I should have gotten those figures. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I don't remember. It's not, I, I want to say it's about half, but I'm not sure. Okay, okay, 698 translations of the scriptures. Of the, okay, yeah, New Testament, that's, that's the ones I was thinking of. 1,500 for the New Testament, um, but only 700 the whole Bible. It, it's a daunting task. Some, some translators spend their whole life translating one language, one language. Uh, uh, the Bible into one language. Because you have to know culture also. I, I met a gentleman, he, it, actually a classmate of mine, who uh, uh, 
Boy, you, you could sit him down with any language, and he, he was a, a whiz at it. And he went to Papua New Guinea to translate the, uh, the Testament there. And he said, not only do you have to translate it, but you have to know the culture. And he said, when we talk today, I said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. He said, for the Papua New Guineans, that means absolutely nothing. Because we, we feel that the heart is the center of emotions. They say the gut, your stomach. Okay, I get a knot in my stomach, you know. That, so they had, to, they had to figure out a way to translate that into their language so they would understand it. See the difficulty in that? Yeah. Okay. That's off the subject, but I think it, it gives you an idea of what, what is facing the world today. Okay. Verse uh, 10. Now we're going to go into an account from Shem, okay, because Shem is going to be the great-great-grandfather of Abram, who will be eventually Abraham, okay? Abraham and Sarai are from the family of Shem, okay? So this is the account of Shem's family line. Now they, now again, you know, you might wonder why do we have it earlier and later? It's just the way the Hebrew would write it, okay? This is important now because they're, they're trying to make a different point. They're trying to show you the generations down to Abraham and how he becomes the father of this nation. Two years after the flood, when Shem was 100 years old, he became the father of Aphidax. And after he became the father of Aphidax, Shem lived 500 years and had other sons and daughters. Now, we had heard earlier that God was going to limit the, the age of people. It does come, but it's coming in a progression here. When Aphidax had lived 35 years, he became the father of Shelah. And after he became the father of Shelah, Aphidax lived 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Sheila had lived, do I need to go through all of this? Okay. So we have down, 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 down. Okay. Let's look at 26. Okay. 26. Verse 26. Unless you'd like to read them all, who would like me to read them all? Okay. <laughs> I was going to make you do it. <laughs> okay. Look at, look at verse 26. Um, after, after Terah had lived 70 years, he became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. So the three sons now are going, to, we're going to follow that. So we're looking at Abraham's line. This is the account of Terah's family line. Terah became the father of Abraham, Neha, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. Okay. So what is that going to make Abram and Lot? Uncle and nephew. That's important to understand, okay? Because that's going to play in after a while. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans. That's probably northern Mesopotamia, okay? So one of the three sons dies before the father. Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran. Do you get that? Okay, it's their, their family is intermarrying. Okay? Um, what, so you, so... Haran marries the, the um, well, I'm sorry, uh, Nahor marries the daughter of his son, which would make her his niece, right? After the flood, there was a lot of intermarriage. There was a lot of intermarriage after the flood. There had to be. There had to be, yes. Yeah. But this is going to play in later on. It doesn't say it here, but just to give you a little heads up, Abram is going to marry Sarai. Sarai is what? His half-sister. Half 
Sar Sarai is his half-sister. Later on, when he gets into trouble, he'll say, uh, this is my sister. Is he lying? Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about that. You can't halfway lie, okay? Yeah. <laughs> I, I told you the story about me and, and getting caught in the speed trap, right? Okay. It, no, you don't remember that story? Oh, okay, very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> We were in upstate New York, and we were the, in, in New York at this time, I had a church, and I was doing a wedding at another church where I had served, and um, it was Sunday afternoon, and I was speeding. I'll admit it. I'll confess. I was speeding. And they had um, uh, checks, uh, police checks. Um, what did they call them? They had a, a special name for them. What? Now, there wasn't a speed trap. They weren't doing that. They would just, they would stop people and check your inspection and tires, safety check or something like that. Troopers check, I think they called it. Troopers check. Anyway, I come up this hill and there was a long line of cars waiting and I screeched to a halt. I mean, I screeched. And I see the trooper raise his head and he points to me and he goes, so I pull out a line, and I come down, and I'm there, and I open my window, and in those days, I wore my clerical collar, so I had my collar on. And he looks in the window, and he says, Father, you don't have to wait in line. Get going. <laughs> so I took off. <laughs> Bene I didn't say anything. <laughs> I am a father. I was a father. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting next to me was Benita. I said, if we get caught in another trap, just say you're my sister. <laughs> good enough for Abraham, good enough for you. <laughs> of course, she's not even related to me, so I couldn't get away with a half truth. I was, a, yeah. <laughs> We laugh about that a lot. Our kids love that story, you know. Oh, Dad. Okay. All right, so uh, they were both married. Now, Sarah was childless because she was not able to conceive, okay? I don't know the culture of this day, but I'll tell you by the time it gets to Jesus, the culture of the Jewish people is if you are barren, you were cursed by God. Okay, it was the worst thing that could happen to a woman. All right? And I imagine it probably was pretty bad for Sarah, Sarai. Okay, uh, Taran took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. Okay, so he's going to go back to the Holy Land. Cana is the Holy Land. Okay? Jerusalem, all that area. All right? But when they came to Haran, now, I, sometimes people get confused. This is a totally different name than Haran, his son. And if you look at it, it's spelled differently. In Hebrew, it's very, very different. Okay? They settled there. Now, why didn't he make the full trip? I've heard pastors preach on that saying that God called him. He didn't follow through with God's call. Uh, I, we don't know. Maybe he got sick. Maybe he was just tired. He, d he was planning on it. He didn't make it. Okay? Um, Taran, Tara lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. So now Abram and Lot and the wives are there. Okay. Let's go on. I got through another chapter. Hey, this is pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Charles. <laughs> chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. 
Uh, what do you think about that? When, when you read that, how does that hit you? How did he tell it? Yeah, it hits me first. Okay. It could have been, we, we know it different ways. Sometimes it was a vocal voice. Sometimes it was in a dream. Sometimes it was through other people. Um, sometimes the angels announce God's word. So any one of those. How he did it in this case, I don't know. But he did it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with you, Michelle. I, I said that some pastors will preach on that. I don't see that scripturally, that he was really called by God. I think it was just a desire to get back to that homeland. Now there's a change, and I think I, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, now, now God is doing the directing and saying, Abram, you've got to go there. So this is not just, it's not just a desire, it's a command of God. But I, I, I see that, I guess maybe, maybe I'm putting too much into this, but I'm thinking how difficult that would be to, to hear God's voice and say, I got to leave everybody, my family, my country, everything that's familiar, to go to some place that God will tell me to, to be eventually. What, what faith and trust that must have taken, you know? I, I think about sometimes immigrants, my my great-grandparents, uh, you know, they came from Germany, and uh, I would imagine that was difficult, but they knew where they were going to and probably had to come here because of economic reasons, you know. I think there's a difference there. Here, there's, there's no problem. God is just saying, get up and go. And how often, I wonder in my own life, God has said, get up and go, and I didn't go, you know. Um, what, I'll get to both of you. Um, you know, in, in the Lutheran Church, we work on a call system. And what that means is that we call the pastor, and then the pastor prays over it, can either accept or, de or reject that call. And I had, uh, um, men, my first call, I said, I don't even know what to do. Do I take it? Do I not take it? But there was once in my life that I felt God really called me and was here to, to, uh, to Texas which is probably the furthest thing from my mind in those days. I got a phone call from a pastor in Texas, and I got off the phone call, and I said to Benita, this was before I had received the call. Before they had interviewed me, it was just a call with the pastor. I said, Benita, we're going to Texas. I, I just felt that God wanted me here. You know, So I, I have felt that, and that's a difficult thing. You know, we were moving far away from family and friends, but it was probably a lot easier for us than it was for them. How many more years will it be that you'll have spent more time in Texas than anywhere else? That'll make you a Texan. Yeah. Um, in a couple of weeks, I'll be 69. And we've been here 45 years. You're a Texan. I hope that didn't go on the... Oh, no, I've been in the ministry 45. <laughs> I, it, 20, 26, 27? I'm getting close. Yeah, I'm getting close. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm going to get back. Janice, I think, and then... Yeah. Uh, questions? Joyce. I said Janice. Joyce. <laughs> I should have told you something. So I said, I don't know how I'll ever fit in here. <laughs> you know, 
because I have no relatives or friends. I didn't know anyone. I just came cold because he's down. So I said, even if they offer me the job, I'm, I'm going to go. I'm not going to accept it. So I got in my uh, rental car and I pulled into the driveway to uh, just go back to the hotel where I was. And these two big headlights say, St. Phillips, New York. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Another question? Well, we don't really know how long they were even there. No. For it to make it a difficult choice or an easy choice, right? Mm. Yeah, you know, because they, if they got there and Taryn died, you know, shortly after that, it was still only them. Yeah. So they're still... Yeah, they, they, they're still progressing through. Yeah. I see your point. I guess I assume that they were there for quite a while. Yeah. So, so it could have been easy. It could have been not easy. Um, mm. Yeah. I, I, I'll look at... I guess I always assumed that they were there for quite a while. Yeah. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Okay. Um, let, let's go on. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. Um, so I had two questions. One of them was, uh, archaeologically, isn't Ur like the very, the very first civilization that we know of? Like the first city? Uh, the question was, Ur was one of the very first civilizations we know of. I don't know that. Um, uh, maybe. Um, what, what, I, what I have heard, what I have heard is that in the 70s, they did a lot of archaeological work in Ur, and Ur had a very sophisticated civilization at this time. Okay. So, so it's kind of inherited the stream of civilization from Babel, I guess. This, everybody else just kind of dissipated and wasn't as, I guess, together as right. Ur. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then, so the second question kind of related to that, too, is so if we, you know, I guess later patriarchs, kind of like, you're the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob. How did they view God, I guess? Like, how would Abraham, like, you're the God of Noah? Like, or... It, it, doesn't, it doesn't say that at that point. It just says God. Okay. okay. So, it, yet, after generations, they're starting to say, well, what is your God called? What, what is your God's name? And, and they didn't really have a name for God. So it was always the God of our fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. So I'm following my father's God. It isn't until Moses, and Moses says, what is your name, that we have Yahweh. So it's, it's a while yet before that. One thing that I think we mentioned here with Shem is that that's from his name is what we get the word Shem, a semi from. Yeah. And this is not only God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, but it's also for the Arabs. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sure. All, all the, the Arabs and the Jews. Yeah. As one family, yeah. Are yeah. And so when people say you're being anti Semitic because you don't like Jews, well, it also means you don't like Arabs. <laughs> yeah. Because they're all together. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, that, that, was, that was the area they settled, was that Arabian area. And Damascus gets its first name from Hashem, is the name of Damascus in the ancient days. Mm -hmm. Now, of yeah. But it means uh, the, the house of, uh, of, uh, of Shem. Mm -hmm. That's Damascus. Yeah. 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 Mike? First of all, Abram was an idol worshiper. Uh, yes. So it, I mean, yeah. Him, right. But, that's but then, and then, yeah. Is talking to the Sanhedrin. Yeah. And he says, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land and I will show you. Yeah. Well, you're, you're. 
Yeah, but you're, you're assuming that appeared means a physical appearance. Yeah. It, it means uh, to be manifest. Um, so it would be, um, it could be manifest in a number of ways. But God still spoke, spoke to him. He was in Yeah. He didn't even move the first step. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh. Well, he was still in Mesopotamia. Well, that, uh, yeah, but, but Haran is, would still be part of what they would call Mesopotamia. I, I see, you, what you're saying is that before he even moved with his father, Taran, he was called, well, not necessarily because that they would consider this all part of Mesopotamia. Was, uh, so I think he's talking about this call. I think Genesis 12, this call, is the call they're talking about in Acts. Right. Yeah. Not a previous one. Okay. And, and this is where I wanted to get today. Okay. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. So God is setting up his people to be blessed to be what? A blessing. Yeah. So, some of you are smiling because you were at first service. Some of you will smile at second service <laughs> if you're still awake. <laughs> and I will bless you who bless you. And, um, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Misspoke. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And that is fulfilled, we believe, through Christ Jesus. He is a descendant of Abraham, and they are all we are blessed by that descendant. So that was a blessing. Jews and Gentiles alike, all people, all peoples on earth. Yeah, this is setting this up for all nations eventually to come back together again. Yep. Okay. Um, I'll read a little bit further. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham, Abram, I keep messing up. Not yet. He's not Abraham yet. Abram was 75 years old when he set out for Haran. He took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran. All of his slaves, concubines, servants, whoever. And they sent out for the land of Cana, and they arrived there. Abraham, Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. And that's, again, one of the descendants, okay? And if you look at that chart, you can see where that descendant was from. The Lord appeared to Abraham and, to, and said, To your offspring I will give this land. It is generations later that that is fulfilled. And one of the things it says to me is that our timing isn't always God's timing. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Okay, and that's where I'm going to end for today. Okay? I think what we can take away from this is that God is faithful. He calls his people. We need to listen and follow through. Yeah, Terry? The bricks. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, tar for <coughs> oil. That's the first indication of oil in Mesopotamia is, is here. That's what it means. Oh. Oil. Okay. So tar is really an oil product, you're saying. Yep. Okay. So even then. Liquid asphalt. Liquid asphalt. Okay. Didn't, I, I, I didn't know that. Okay, let's close with a word of prayer. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings that you pour out on us, and we know that we are blessed to be a blessing. So, Lord, we ask you to, to just open our hearts and minds that we might really hear your call to see where you want us to go and do what is best, not just for ourselves, but for your kingdom and building that kingdom here on earth and into eternity. So, Lord, help us be the people you want us to be, to be a blessing to others. We ask all of this in the most precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Receive the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a great week.